leadership on this really critically important issue. Washington is broken. After years of excessive spending and wasteful stimulus projects, our national debt now tops $21 trillion. That's more than $60,000 for each and every American. Mr. Speaker, this is unsustainable. But we are here to pass a resolution, the Balanced Budget Amendment. This is a solution to this trillion-dollar debt. Simply put, this amendment means Washington can't spend more than it takes in. It means Congress has to live within a budget, just like families in West Virginia. Families every day have to make careful choices about how to best spend their money. It's time for the federal government to do the same. I'm a proud co-sponsor of this resolution and urge my colleagues to vote yes later today for a balanced budget amendment. It's time to get our fiscal house in order. Pass this resolution. Pass the balanced budget amendment. Let's get our fiscal house in order. The American people are depending on us. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Louisiana reserves. Without objection, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Cohen, from Tennessee will take control of the time. Thank you, sir. And I, and I yield uh, two minutes to Mr. Connolly, the gentleman from Virginia, and a scholar and a gentleman. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two minutes. I thank, I thank my good friend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's a word for what we're witnessing today, and that word is chutzpah. The majority is proposing a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution of the United States just months after passing the Trump tax scheme, which the Congressional Budget Office warned would increase the deficit by 1.6 trillion dollars over 10 years. So having broken the bank and spent their way into default, they now want a balanced budget amendment to protect all the rest of us. Like I said, chutzpah. One would think such devoted Reaganites might have learned the lesson already. The majority has once again asked the American people to stomach a massive deficit increase on the hope and the prayer the tax decreases will pay for themselves. That's the same trickle-down narrative we heard in the Reagan years and the Bush years, and it didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. In the 1981 tax cuts were so disastrous, for example, for federal deficits that Presidents Reagan and Bush Sr. had to enact legislation to raise taxes to make up for the shortfall in 1982, 1983, 1984, 1987, and 1990. Other than that, yeah, tax cuts pay for themselves. When President Obama took office, he inherited a deficit of more than $1.5 trillion in the depths of the Great Depression that President Bush gave him. That deficit was cut by more than two-thirds in President Obama's tenure in office. By this time next year, however, the Republican tax policy and President Trump's policies will have doubled the deficit in just the first two years. This level of irresponsibility, fiscal irresponsibility, could rival that of the Bush years when we went from a surplus to a deficit, from $128 billion surplus to a deficit of $1.16 trillion. Trickle-down theories don't work. They're a bad experiment for the American people. I urge rejection on the grounds of intellectual honesty and integrity of this balanced budget amendment. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Tennessee reserves. Then the gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield to myself three minutes. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. As virtually every American now understands, Washington is broken. For years, Congress has spent irresponsibly and with what seems to be little or no thought for how it might affect future generations. We're, we're passing along a bill that our children and grandchildren may never be able to pay. And it's immoral, as immoral as it is unsustainable. 
Meanwhile, our nation's top military officials have repeatedly warned Congress that the number one threat to our national security is our debt. We have no choice now but to correct this wrong and institute policies that promote fiscal responsibility. Currently, our national debt exceeds $20 trillion, and the number increases every second. Mr. Speaker, when I do town halls back home, I put the debt clock up on the screen very often and uh, allow our constituents to watch that clock toll. It's, it's frightening. The, the last om, omnibus package, which is a whopping 2,232 pages in length, allocated another $1.3 trillion. That's about $582 million of federal spending per page. Our government is out of control, and we have to put an end to the dangerous and clearly excessive spending patterns that are coming out of, out of Washington and out of this body. As I've said on more than one occasion, people all across America sit down at their kitchen tables and create budgets for their families. Small businesses make countless sacrifices to manage their balance sheets, and our government should act no differently. We cannot continue to spend money we don't have and drive ourselves further into the debt of hostile nations like China, who is the, the primary creditor in holding all of our debt. Passing a balanced budget amendment is a common-sense solution that will put us back on the right track and restore fiscal sanity to the Congress. The balanced budget amendment will ensure our government acts as a good steward of America's tax dollars, not only today, but for all the days in the future. It has the potential to make the bloated budgets of Washington a thing of the past. Opponents of this amendment will say that passing this will force serious cuts to our budget, and to that we respond and say, of course it will. We simply cannot get out of the hole that we've created without making tough decisions. But that's our job. That's why we're elected as the duly elected representatives of the people. Right now, our country faces a point of no return with our debt, and there should be nothing controversial about telling our federal government to act within its means. This is simply about aligning and agreeing upon our top priorities. Thomas Jefferson said that the representatives of, na of a nation should never take on more debt than they themselves can pay in their own lifetime. We've abandoned that principle a long time ago, and unfortunately, we've, we've already far exceeded that amount in this body and in our lifetime, and it's now our moral obligation to right this wrong. This is really about who we are as Americans, if you listen to the founders. Th that's why I urge my colleagues to support the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution and help restore and preserve the American dream for our children and for all future generations. We owe that to the country. Fiscal sanity, responsibility, and good stewardship is why we were sent here, and it's what we must do. I reserve the remainder of our time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Before I yield to Representative Scott, I just want to remind the members that my Republican Senator Bob Corker said that this Congress will go down in history as the worst fiscal crisis Congress in history for having voted for both the tax scam bill and the big cuts for the wealthy. Mr. Scott, five minutes, please. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to H.J. Res 2. We often get distracted by debating the title of a proposed constitutional amendment without getting into serious discussion about whether or not the specific provisions will actually help balance the budget. If we're ever going to balance the budget, the fact is it's going to require members to cast some tough votes. And many of these votes will be career-ending votes, and a constitutional amendment calling itself the balanced budget amendment cannot change that reality. Meaningful deficit reduction is politically difficult. And it's ironic that the Republican majority seems suddenly concerned about uh, the deficit and balancing budget. They must have forgotten that just four months ago they voted for a $1.5 trillion tax scam that gave massive handouts to big corporations and the wealthiest 1 percent. They repeatedly claimed that these tax cuts would pay for themselves, but last week the Congressional Budget Office told the truth, estimating that their tax scam will add almost $2 trillion to our national debt. One of the most, one, Mr. Speaker, one of the most consequential f votes I cast early in my career was the 1993 Clinton budget. That budget included tax increases and spending cuts, many of which were very unpopular at the time, but it was fiscal, the fiscally responsible thing to do. Not one Republican voted for the 1993 Clinton budget. Needless to say, the 93 budget was a tough vote, but it helped create over 20 million jobs, stock market, more than tripled, led to the first balanced budget in a generation and by the end of the Clinton administration and included projected surpluses large enough to have paid off the entire national debt 
held by the public by 2008. But it also contributed to 50 House Democrats losing their seats in the next election. As soon as the Republicans took control of the federal government in the 2001 with the White House, House, and Senate, they passed massive tax cuts, not paying for them, fought two wars, didn't pay for it, passed a prescriptive drug benefit, didn't pay for it. So by 2008, instead of zero national debt held by the public, the debt was $5.8 trillion. So now we have the balanced budget amendment. And the problem is that the balanced budget amendment will not balance the budget. The fact is that the major provision in this, in this legislation is a requirement that if the budget is unbalanced, it requires a three-fifths vote. And the fact is that this proposal will actually make it virtually impossible to ever pass a fiscally tough deficit reduction plan similar to the 1993 Clinton budget. That budget wasn't balanced in the first year, and under this proposed amendment, instead of a simple majority, it would require a three-fifths supermajority in the House and the Senate. The fact is, it should be obvious that any tough deficit reduction plan will, will be unbalanced in the first year, and so it will be harder to pass by requiring a three-fifths supermajority than a simple majority. The question is, will that supermajority make, make it more likely that we would end up with a fiscally responsible budget or a fiscally irresponsible budget? Obviously, it's more likely that we would pass a fiscally irresponsible Christmas tree budget where every member gets a present under the tree than it would be to get enough career-ending votes to meet the three-fifths requirement under this legislation. And note that this amendment places no limit on how far out of balance the budget can be once you get to three-fifths. Mr. Speaker, we shouldn't be distracted by the bill's misleading title. Uh, the budget, the balancing the budget will require tough votes, not constitutional amendments. My colleagues must be serious, must seriously consider whether the bill's actual provisions will help or hurt. It's obvious it will make it virtually impossible to pass any kind of balanced budget or responsible budget. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I ask my colleagues to oppose this legislation. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Tennessee reserves. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to the gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. Handel. Thank you. The gentlelady is recognized Speaker. for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me first begin by commending Chairman Goodlatte and my colleagues on the House Judiciary Committee for their hard work on this important issue. I've been in Congress just 10 months, but I've already seen firsthand that the budget process is fundamentally broken. While I supported the funding measures under, the bro under this broken process, I did so with reluctance. But both parties, both parties have brought us to this place with severe fiscal challenges that we face today. But balancing our budget is not, should not be a partisan issue. Across the country, virtually every state has a balanced budget requirement, and governors and legislatures of both parties meet that requirement. Congress should too. Ultimately, balanced budgets are about accountability. We must hold the federal government accountable and Congress accountable and insist that the overall budget be managed in a fiscally responsible way. The status quo, the same old kick the can down the road, we'll get to it next time approach, is simply no longer an option. Big problems require tough choices. Every day that we continue to borrow and assume more debt, our decisions get all the more difficult and the solutions all the more catastrophic. This balanced budget amendment is a first, only a first step, but a much needed step to improving the fiscal state of our nation. Our current path is unsustainable. Sooner than most realize, this path will not even allow us to continue to meet the promises already made to the American people. Don't spend more than you earn. That's what I was taught. And that's what families across this country do every single day. It's time for Congress to do the same, Mr. Speaker. I ask my colleagues to support this balanced budget amendment, not for the sake of politics, but rather for the sake of the future of this country and generations to come. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Louisiana reserves. And the gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you. I, I yield five minutes to my ranking member on transportation, who was always so generous and kind, Mr. DeFazio. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman. Uh, there weren't too many of us here on the floor today or here in 1996 when I supported a 
balanced budget uh, amendment. It did pass the House, failed by one vote in the Senate. Had it become law, George Bush could not have invaded Iraq and simultaneously cut taxes and blown the projected surplus into a huge deficit and debt. Uh, but here we are today. Now, this debate was actually scheduled for April 1st, you know, April Fool's Day, but uh, the House was on its Easter recess, so they, this is as soon as they could bring it up on the floor. But it is an April Fool. This is an April Fool. Now, we had one colleague call it, say, chutzpah. I was trying to think of ways to describe it. Uh, dissimulation, insincerity, false piousness, hypocrisy. Uh, not this balanced budget amendment, not at this time. They have just cut revenues by $3 trillion. We're projecting a deficit of $1 trillion in two years, and they're saying they want to cut taxes more. Well, then that means something else got to go. And uh, Speaker Ryan has already talked about what the something else is. It's Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. Those are the things that got to go. Well, there's a, a dirty little secret about Social Security. This is, I was actually using this on 9-11. I'll have to get an updated version. But there actually is a Social Security Trust Fund. And this is a depository instrument for the Social Security Trust Fund. And it is here backed by the full faith and credit of the government of the United States of America to be paid to the Federal Old Age and Survivors Insurance Fund. There's $3 trillion that has been collected from every working American in the Social Security Trust Fund. Now, we have an aging population. There's a problem, but it could be fixed. But the point is, under this amendment, if it was law today, Social Security benefits would be cut today because they would not allow, under this amendment, Social Security could only spend its income, which this year was $40 billion less than its outlays. What did it do? It cashed in some of its $3 trillion of assets, and they paid full Social Security benefits. So if this little dream that they have here going past... Uh, every American would have seen their Social Security reduced by $643 this year, and every year that number would grow, while the $3 trillion already collected from the American people to pay benefits would never be paid out. Talk about false promises to the American people. That's one heck of a false promise. Now, I've introduced a balanced budget amendment that makes a little more sense. Can't have these... OCO's overseas contingency operation funds where we shower 50, 100 billion dollars on the Pentagon and it doesn't count. We're borrowing the money. It's creating debt, but it doesn't count. It's off budget, off budget. Don't worry about it. Under my amendment, unless you had a declared war, unless Congress had the guts to declare a war when we have to fight someone overseas, you couldn't have that kind of overseas contingency operation fund and do money off the books. My balanced budget amendment also would protect the Social Security and Medicare trust funds from those who would rob from that trust fund and begin to immediately reduce benefits for Social Security and Medicare. This is a ruse. I mean, talk about the most, you know, drunken sailors spending money and then, whoa, I just, oh, I got a wicked headache. Ah, let's pass a balanced budget amendment. Maybe that'll cure it. It ain't going to cure it. You know, we need fiscal responsibility around here, and it's got to be a balance of rescinding some of your obscene tax cuts, $3 trillion worth, which would go a long way toward helping move us toward a balanced budget, and imposing a little fiscal discipline on the Pentagon. You know, the Pentagon has yet to be audited. The only agency, the only agency of the federal government that cannot be audited happens to get the largest single discretionary grant of money every year. And once... I did manage to pass an amendment on the floor with uh, Representative Freelinghausen to require an audit. Guess what? Whoa, that disappeared in the conference committee because the Pentagon can't be audited, doesn't want to be audited, and they just need more money. Don't worry, they'll spend it wisely. So let's talk about real fiscal discipline around here, real balance, and a real balanced budget amendment that protects the assets of the Social Security Trust Fund and Medicare. You people don't care about that. You want to kill it. With that, I yield back to balance my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Tennessee reserves. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to the uh, principal gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Byrne. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I rise today to lend my strong support for this balanced budget amendment. 
Mr. Speaker, the very first bill I introduced when the 115th Congress kicked off last year was a balanced budget amendment. With the national debt at over $21 trillion, it is no secret that the federal government has a spending issue. Before coming to Congress, I served in the Alabama State Legislature. Like many states, Alabama is required to pass a budget that does not spend more than we have. We do it each year. A balanced budget is not some far-flung idea. Families in southwest Alabama and all around the country sit around the kitchen table and figure out how to make ends meet. Small businesses face the exact same challenges. The federal government should be required to play by the same rules. I want to be clear about a few things. First, despite what my colleagues on the other side of the aisle believe, the answer to our debt issue is not to tax the American people more. We do not have a tax problem. We have a spending problem. Second, the most serious drivers of the national debt are on autopilot. So-called mandatory spending programs must be reined in, and a balanced budget amendment would finally require Congress to tackle those programs head on. Mr. Speaker, I know passing a balanced budget would be hard, but I didn't run for Congress because I thought the job would be easy. We were elected by our neighbors to make difficult choices and decisions. We can make a strong step in the right direction by by passing this balanced budget amendment. And I urge all my colleagues to join me in supporting this bill today. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Louisiana Reserves. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Government is and should be about more than just dollars and cents. Government, and especially democratic government, is about nurturing community, taking care of one another, and defending our common humanity. H.J. Res. 2, proposing a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced budget every fiscal year, strikes sharply against those core values, as much that we see in government these days does. A balanced budget amendment undermines our commitment to each other, as expressed through critical social safety net programs like supplemental nutrition assistance programs, SNAP, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. My constituents at the 9th Congressional District of Tennessee and millions of vulnerable Americans nationwide depend on these and other programs to make ends meet in difficult economic circumstances. Therefore, it concerns me greatly that this Congress, which hypocritically passed massive tax giveaways to corporations and the super wealthy, has chosen to devote its limited time to what is essentially a gimmick to avoid actually making politically difficult decisions about the federal budget. Just this week, my Tennessee colleague, the respected Senator Bob Corker, called out his fellow Republicans when he tweeted, if we were serious about balancing the budget, we would do it. But instead of doing the real work, some will push this symbolic measure so they can feel good when they go home to face voters. I wear on my lapel the letter F. That's the grade that Bob Corker and I give this Congress for its work on toward balancing a budget. Trillions of dollars of debt with tax giveaways to the wealthiest. Trillions of dollars of debt with a budget that gives the Pentagon $70 billion more than they want. A balanced budget is nothing but an attempt to shortcut government and it would impose real harm on millions of Americans. Social safety net programs would be a particular risk since a balanced budget amendment to be adopted because they are funded every year by drawing on savings accumulated in prior years. And let's be real about what's going on. After giving tax breaks to the wealthiest in corporations, after giving away massive budget amounts, particularly to defense, they want a balanced budget amendment? How would they balance the budget? On Medicare, on Social Security, and on Medicaid. On people who are ill and seniors who need money to live on and health care to keep their lives going. That's who this cruel Congress would say the balanced budget amendment falls on. They would be on the chopping block. This funding mechanism ensures that benefits can be paid to those who need them and provides the opportunity to save, stave off funding shortfalls before they occur. The state of the Department of Justice is another example. Given President Trump's sharp political attacks on General Sessions out of frustration with his recusal from any investigation concerning Russia's interference in our presidential election, voter suppression efforts, the resurgence of white nationalists in American politics, and the active efforts to undermine the work of a free press are other meaningful topics worthy of our attention, issues that are important to the American public, not 
a balanced budget amendment that won't come into existence and will harm the American people. I strongly oppose the idea of a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution because it threatens Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It threatens SNAP. It threatens programs that keep people alive and make their existence tolerable. Many constituents of mine depend on these, and many in America do. The House has better things to devote its time. I strongly oppose House Joint Resolution 2, and I continue to reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the distinguished chair of our Republican Studies Committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Walker. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Our national debt stands at over $21 trillion. This is not a surprise to anybody. It should frighten us enough to immediately alter the behavior of this House. Congress approved a largely unpaid $1.3 trillion omnibus, several supplementals, and exploded two years of spending caps all in the last few months. Unsustainable, mandatory, and undisciplined discretionary spending designed decades ago have created a debt monster that is seemingly unstoppable. Over the last few months, we have heard a great deal from our Democratic friends and their newfound concern about the rising deficits in debt. So my question is, how many will join us in supporting the balanced budget amendment? Many Democratic members in the past were willing to vote for what 49 out of 50 states already have, a balanced budget. In fact, in 1996, a balanced budget amendment garnered 72 Democratic votes in the House, including our esteemed colleague across the aisle, Mr. Hoyer. In 2011, the same version we are voting on today got 25 Democrat votes in support. I wonder how many have the courage to support it now. We know what it takes. We should roll back wasteful spending, including rescinding appropriations that aren't needed. We need to reform our entitlement programs, including getting able-bodied adults back to work. This is about hope, not judgment. I invite my colleagues to join me in supporting this amendment that is our moral obligation to ensure the American dream retain, remains attainable for our children and for future generations. You back. The gentleman reserves, the gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. I, thank you, sir. I recognize the lady from Illinois for uh, two minutes, Ms. Schakowsky. The gentlelady is recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding. First, the Republicans passed a hack scam that blows a $2 trillion hole in the budget and gives 83% of its tax cuts to the wealthiest among us and corporate CEOs. Then, they offer a budget that would fill that gap by cutting more than $2 trillion in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and even programs like Meals on Wheels. And now, they want to amend our Constitution to require a balanced budget. Now, we know how the Republicans plan to balance the budget on the backs of seniors. We've seen this movie before, budget after budget that cuts Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, budgets that leave seniors without their earned benefits or access to long-term care, um, budgets that, private, that privatize the Veterans Administration and Medicare, providing vouchers and not health benefits that raise the age of eligibility for Medicare and Social Security, that cap and slash Medicaid, the largest source of long-term care. And no wonder seniors groups are raising the alarm. Under this bill, the AARP says, quote, Social Security and Medicare would cease to provide a predictable source of financial and health security in retirement. And the Alliance for Retired Americans calls it, quote, irresponsible and extremely harmful to older Americans. And the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare says it would force seniors severe cuts in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and other vital federal programs. And the Strength and Social Security Coalition says, quote, we regard a vote for the the balanced budget amendment as a vote to cut Social Security and as well as Medicare and Medicaid. You know, when Paul Ryan announced his retirement yesterday, he said before he leaves, he hopes that he's going to be able to go after these retirements and cut these uh, entitlements and cut them. Social Security and Medicare. This has already been announced. This is the future. If we let it happen, we need to vote no. And I yield back. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Happy to yield two minutes to my colleague from uh, the great state of Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on my first day serving in this Congress, um, I introduced a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, and I'm honored to be co-sponsoring the bill on the floor today.
As I travel back home in my district, as I'm sure so many of my colleagues do, get this question. And I'm repeatedly asked, why, does, why doesn't Congress manage the national budget the same way businesses manage their budgets and families manage their budget? Why doesn't Congress follow the same rules that businesses and families do, that we only spend what we generate in revenues? And it's a good question, Mr. Speaker, which gets us to the need for a balanced budget amendment. One would think that we would not need to amend the Constitution to do what members of this body should be doing anyway. This is common sense, Mr. Speaker, but for decades we've seen the problem perpetuate, which is the responsibility of both parties. And I'm convinced that this is the only mechanism to force this body to balance the budget. $21 trillion in debt, Mr. Speaker. And to my friends voicing opposition, we need to be honest about what this bill does. This bill does not necessitate any cuts of any kind. It simply requires that the budget balance. A commitment to raising revenues through pro-growth economic policies is the answer. And that's what this bill will force this body to do, raise revenues to offset expenditures on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis. Mr. Speaker, prior to this Congress, our economy was sluggishly growing at about 1.6 growth in GDP, which is fiscally and financially unsustainable. We are now well over 2 percent, on our way to 3 percent, and we need to get to 4 percent. And as one of only a handful of CPAs in this Congress, I know that economic growth has three essential components – tax reform, regulatory reform, and a balanced budget. When you balance the books, you create jobs, which leads to more revenue, which leads to an expanding economy, making it easier for us to fund our critical priorities like serving our veterans, protecting our troops, funding public education, and preserving our environment. Mr. Speaker, that is what this bill is about. And that's why I'm proud to co-sponsor this legislation. This is common sense, Mr. Speaker. The American people want this by overwhelming margins. We need to get this done for them. It's our moral responsibility. I yield back. We reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, before I recognize Mr. Neal, I want to say Mr. Fitzpatrick got the award from the American Bar Association for his good work on legal services, and I compliment him on that. I yield uh, five minutes to our distinguished ranking member on Ways and Means, Representative Richie Neal. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Tennessee, and I ask for permission to address the House and revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. The previous speaker said we really shouldn't have to do this. And the answer is we don't have to do this. Bill Clinton proved on four occasions that you can balance the budget. It's only been done five times since the end of World War II. So what we really should be calling this legislation that's in front of us today is the Jesse James Seeks Clemency Act. We are here because of their tax cut. Invade Iraq? Let's have a tax cut. Invade Afghanistan? Let's have a tax cut. The tax cut's the answer to everything. The last round? Let's borrow $2.3 trillion over 10 years before the Federal Reserve Board, by the way, has a chance to raise interest rates three times this year, as they predicted, for the purposes of providing a tax cut. Oh, no, by the way, how about that old song, don't worry because tax cuts pay for themselves? This is what we've heard here, and this is what has put us in this predicament that we're in, $20 trillion worth of debt. Now, here's the caveat that they always attach to these arguments, by the way. If there's a Democratic president, you need to balance the budget. If there's a Republican president, you don't need to balance the budget. Their spending priorities are keen. It's borrowed money to provide tax cuts for people at the very top, further concentrating wealth. Now, let me give you some numbers here that I've paid a lot of attention to over the years. On January 19, 2001, when Bill Clinton said goodbye, we were staring at a $5.6 trillion surplus and four balanced budgets and record economic growth, the greatest economic growth spurt in the history of America. Surplus, again, $5.6 trillion. So what happened? Well, we cut taxes over the objections of many of us in 2001 by $1.3 trillion. Then we had a recession where we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. Oh, by the way, in 2003, we came back and cut taxes again here by $1 trillion plus the bonus. Then they decided to do a repatriation tax holiday. 
And now they're here like this. My father used to have a great line. He used to say, at least Jesse James had enough respect to wear a mask. I mean, this is unbelievable that they would come in with a balanced budget after what they have done repeatedly all of these years to wreck the budgets, all under the guise of if we simply cut taxes, everything will get better. The reason that this deficit is ballooning is not because of an increase in spending. Revenue as a percent of gross domestic product remains roughly in that 17 percent to 18 percent. That's the post-war norm, except for the end of the Bush years, Bush W., when revenue as a percent of gross domestic product went to 15 cents on the dollar because of the tax cuts and, by the way, increased spending for Iraq and Afghanistan. So let me remind our Republican friends of this. The priorities have been wrong. We could have reached an accord on these issues, but today, to do this, to bring forth a balanced budget amendment, we're going to disturb the Constitution of the United States to maybe get them through the next round of congressional elections, because that's all this is about. So the tax cuts are going to reduce revenue. And here's the footnote that you might want to pay some attention to. Eighty-three percent of this tax cut that they voted for, without one Democrat, incidentally, in the House supporting it, 83 percent of the benefit is going to the top 1 percent of the wage earners in America. And then they found time, by the way, to double the exemption on the estate tax. So we're taking the estate tax from $11 million to $22 million. And remember this about the estate tax. The estate tax is not a tax on Conrad Hilton. The estate tax is a tax on Paris Hilton. And my God, who can be against that? When you think of how this has been pursued, it's all about concentrating more wealth at the very top for people who have said, we don't need it. There wasn't anybody beating down our doors in the top percentile of the wage earners in America saying, cut my taxes. We could have reached an accord on the corporate rate. We could have done some things to, in a bipartisan manner to address some of these issues and making America competitive internationally. But instead, they chose to do what they always do. Let's starve the federal budget and then say, after we starve the federal budget, oh, by the way, we've got to cut Social Security. Let's starve the federal budget of revenue and say, oh, by the way, we've got to cut Medicare. And oh, by the way, let's starve the federal budget and say, we've got to get rid of Medicaid for people who need it. This is why we find ourselves with a $20 trillion debt. And you know what? I'll take the Clinton years and the Obama years compared to what they gave us in terms of federal revenue forecasts. CBO accounts the other day, they came back and said what? These are the numbers. And one minute. Thank Gen you. The gentleman CBO is recognized for one minute. Said, Let us tell you right now what's wrong. They gave us hardcore numbers about economic growth, and they gave us hardcore numbers about debt and deficits. And you know what the answer was? Well, let's not believe what they have to say. Let's not pay any attention to what they have to say, because it doesn't square with the philosophy of tax cuts paying for themselves. So the last point is, if you voted for the tax cuts and you voted for the omnibus spending bill on the Republican side, because I know no Democrat voted for the tax cut, Today, when you come in, you ought to wear a mask when you cast your vote, because Jesse James would be honored. And I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> we reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to hear the gentleman openly acknowledge that not a single Democrat voted for the tax cut. I'm sure the American people would love to hear that. Yield two minutes to the gentleman Thank from you, Ohio, you. Mr. Jordan. Thank three minutes. Sorry, three minutes. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Speaker, everyone knows this is a joke. It's all pretend. Never going to become law. Never going to happen. People are going to support it because voting for a balanced budget amendment is like voting for motherhood and apple pie. But everybody, everybody on this floor knows this is all pretend. The time to deal with spending was three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. That was the time for political courage, some discipline. Some political will was three weeks ago when we got a 2,232-page bill that we had 15 hours to look at. That was when we needed to deal with spending. 15 hours to look at a $1.3 trillion spending package, the second largest spending package in American history, and we had 15 hours to look at it. Hey, well, guess what? You know how long we got to debate it? One hour. On a three-page bill that's never going to happen. You know how long we're debating this? Four hours.
The time for political courage was three weeks ago. We, the last vote we take before the Easter recess, $1.3 trillion of spending, funding things we as Republicans said we would never fund, not funding things we told the voters we were going to fund, and then we go home and we come back, and the first thing we do with four hours of debate, not one like we had on that bill, is a bill that's never going to happen. No wonder Americans hate this place. No wonder they're cynical. I don't blame them. This, this ticks me off. And there's just no other way to say it. And more importantly, it ticks off the American people, and it should. And you know, the last, the last 24 hours, everyone in this town has been focused on who's going to be the next speaker. Let me tell you something. Much more important, a much more important question than who's going to be the next speaker, who's going to be the speaker next year, is what are Republicans going to do this year? Are we going to get back to doing what they elected us, what the American people elected us to do on November 8, 2016? Are we going to get back to doing what we told them we were going to do, the mandate of that election? Are we going to keep doing pretend things like this? Let's do what the... Let's do what we said. We we make this so hard. Let's just do what we said we would do. That'll be good politics. And more importantly, that'll be good policy for the hardworking families of this great country. I yield back. We reserve. Reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the, the ranking member and the future chairman of the Budget Committee, the gentleman from Kentucky, uh, the, Mr. John Yarmouth. The gentleman's recognized. Five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my friend for yielding. Mr. Speaker, just months ago, we were debating the so-called Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. During that debate, I warned that it was the first of the Republicans' three-step plan to give, the wealthy, give to the wealthy and make hardworking families pay the price. Republicans were successful in enacting step one, the tax scam that gave more than 80 percent of the benefits to the top 1 percent. Just one company, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, is now pocketing $218 million more every week under this new law. And they're not alone. These tax cuts are showering big corporations and Wall Street with taxpayer money at an obscene level. That was step one. Step two, exploding our deficits, was confirmed this week by the Congressional Budget Office. They concluded that the GOP tax cuts will add nearly $2 trillion to the federal debt over the next decade. And that brings us to step three. Having provided millionaires and big corporations with huge tax cuts that do little to grow our economy, the GOP has starved our government of revenues. So naturally, they are using the resulting deficits as an excuse for massive cuts to programs that millions of Americans rely on, including Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. That's what the amendment we are now considering would do. It would put in place a constitutionally mandated process solely designed to impose these extreme cuts. And that's because it comes packaged with the GOP's near-religious belief that tax cuts for the rich will save us all. They believe this despite the fact that history and nearly every respected economist will tell you that the only way we can responsibly balance the budget is to include new revenues. So let's call this balanced budget amendment what it is, a stunt to give Republicans political cover for their deficit-exploding tax scam. The party of so-called fiscal hawks has become the party of fiscal hypocrites. They know it, and so do the American people. And while this bill may be a political gimmick, it's a dangerous one that would have dire consequences for our economy and American families. To begin with, when in effect, it would require that the entire federal budget this year would be cut by at least 20 percent. That would be not just unprecedented, it would be devastating. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, veterans' health care, infrastructure, job training, nutrition assistance, programs that help make housing affordable and higher education attainable would all be jeopardized. But that's not all. This amendment would put an intolerable financial strain on every state in this country, forcing them to do more with less. My state of Kentucky relies on federal funds to cover 37% of the Commonwealth's budget, including 16% of education funding and 32% of transportation funding. Speaker Ryan's home state of Wisconsin relies on federal funds to cover 24% of its budget. Chairman Goodlatte's home state of Virginia relies on federal funds to cover 20%. All of that is at risk under this amendment, and it wouldn't stop there. $1.3 
This amendment would not only threaten our ability to respond to economic crises, it would likely make them much worse. During economic downturns, Congress can help stimulate the economy by cutting taxes and increasing investments, as we did during the 2008 financial crisis. But if this amendment had been in place then, our economy would have been in serious jeopardy, facing a much higher risk of a full-on prolonged depression and massive job losses. Should our country face another financial crisis, this amendment would be the worst policy at the worst time. So in sum, this amendment would threaten the retirement security of every senior who relies on Medicare and Social Security and every working, working American paying into these programs now. It jeopardizes every federal program that helps our communities grow and hardworking families succeed. It places extreme financial strain on every state in this country, and it would make it much harder for our government to respond to crises or even function effectively. Other than that, it's a great idea. Mr. Speaker, this is terrible policy that ignores reality and real consequences and purely intended to save Republicans' political rear ends. It's not just me making this case. Republican Senator Bob Corker stated recently, quote, Republicans control the House, Senate, and White House. If we were serious about balancing the budget, we would do it. But instead of doing the real work, some will push this symbolic measure so they can feel good when they go home to face voters, unquote. Well said, Senator Corker. If my Republican colleagues truly believe this is a good bill, then it is good for the American, that it is good for the American people, then it is time for them to go home. I yield back. We could continue to reserve, although we can't add much to what has been said. The gentleman continues to reserve, and the gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes. The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes. The gentleman from Kansas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of House Joint Resolution 2, proposing a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution of the United States. This proposal comes at a critical time for our country. Years of unchecked spending have led to massive deficit. At the same time, Threats at home and abroad, crumbling infrastructure, and natural disasters have forced the government to do more. These two parallel situations require tough decision-making. But that's what the American people expect us to do. As I talk to constituents in my district, one of the issues they continually ask about is the ballooning federal debt that will be passed on to their kids and grandkids. Hardworking Kansans have to balance their checkbook every month. I served as Kansas State Treasurer, where we also had to balance our budget for the state of Kansas. I don't think there's any reason that the federal government should get a pass. That's why I'm proud to support this resolution, which would require the government to spend within its means. During the past year, we have accomplished a lot to help families across America. Cutting regulations and passing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act have helped get government out of the way and our economy growing. Workers are seeing bonuses and larger paychecks. Companies are reinvesting in America, and this growth has allowed us to make significant investments in the military, disaster relief, agriculture, and other areas important to Kansans. However, to build on this progress, we need time to implement policies that will protect future generations from crippling debt. This proposal is a great start and long overdue. But let me be clear, this is not a silver bullet. Balancing our budget and reducing our debt will require reforming our entitlement programs and prioritizing our spending. I also believe it will require rescissions to the budget, and today I call on the President and the Congress to implement those spending cuts which would work towards our goal of fiscal responsibility and stability. This amendment and rescissions are a needed start to that difficult yet immensely important task before us. The future of our country depends on it, and I urge my colleagues to support this resolution. I yield back. We reserve, sir. The gentleman reserves, the gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you. Uh, I yield. The, the leader, one minute, uh, Lady Pelosi, the once and future speaker. The minority leader is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Welcome. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and it's interesting to note Mr. Cohen is a member, Cohen is a member of the Judiciary Committee. This is a balanced budget. Uh, amendment. And what's interesting is it's not coming by way of the uh, Budget Committee, as you might suspect. It is coming by way of the Judiciary Committee because it intends to amend the Constitution of the United States. How sad. <laughs> 
Mr. Speaker, as you know, members of Congress take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. Yet this proposed amendment we are debating does great harm to our sacred founding document. This legislation is a brazen assault on seniors, children, and working families, the American people we were elected to protect. Make no mistake, this GOP con job does nothing, has nothing to do with fiscal responsibility. It is not balanced in terms of money because of their t GOP tax scam that has placed us in a bad spot fiscally, and it's not balanced in terms of values. To the Republicans, fiscal responsibility just means ransacking Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security and breaking our nation's sacred promise of dignity and security for seniors and families. Republicans like to pat themselves on the back and play lip service to the principle of fiscal responsibility. In fact, the deficit hawks have either become an endangered species or extinct. They don't seem to exist in this Republican House of Representatives. It may be counterintuitive to the public, but Democrats have always been the ones who have fought to put our fiscal house in order. In the 1990s, President Clinton put us on a trajectory of job growth and smaller deficits, despite inheriting the massive Reagan-Bush deficits. The last four, some would even say five, but conservatively speaking, the last four Clinton budgets were either in balance or in surplus. President Clinton handed President George W. Bush a projected $5.6 trillion 10-year budget surplus. But Republicans squandered that surplus with massive tax cuts to the wealthy and two unpaid for wars. Their spending sprees exploded a vast new $5 trillion plus debt that was an $11 trillion turnaround from the Democratic Democrats path to surplus under President Obama then Democrats restored responsibility spending rules we had pay as you go do you want to invest in something you must cover it you must offset it or pay for it that held true for investments as well as for tax cuts Republicans didn't mind paying for food stamps but they did mind paying for tax cuts for the rich that they wanted to have exempted from pay as you go. But this Republican Congress, despite President Obama's t restoring uh, responsible spending rules and slashing the Bush deficit by hundreds of billions of dollars, this Republican Congress has raced back toward fiscal ruin, recklessly erasing that progress and exploding the debt with their contempt for fiscal responsibility. Republicans exploded deficits by another $2 trillion with their GOP tax scam and its massive handouts to corporations and the wealthiest 1%. Just this week, the CBO exposed the staggering cost of the Republican special interest agenda, forecasting deficits of nearly $1 trillion or more than every year President, for every, more than every year President Trump remains in office. Understand this, the Trump trillion dollar deficit is here for the life of his presidency. May that be short. Yet Republicans have the nerve to demand that seniors and little children sacrifice to pay for their tax cuts for the rich and corporate America for their fiscal recklessness. GOPs have nothing but contempt for the health and security of America's families. The Trump budget slashed 500, a half a trillion dollars from Medicare, 1.4 trillion dollars from Medicaid, 72 billion dollars from Social Security disability benefits. Why? So they could give a tax cut of a trillion and a half dollars to corporate America with the interest that it incurred would be a, a, over two trillion dollar deficit paid for by cuts in Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Their legislation priorities add to a mountain of utter, utter derision, disregard and disdain for hardworking families from slashing SNAP, that food stamps, to gutting consumer protections for seniors and service members, our men and women in uniform, to sabotaging America's affordable quality health care. And now, with this constitutional amendment, the Republicans found another cynical tool 
to gut the bedrock guarantees of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. This so-called balanced budget amendment, which is going nowhere, it won't even win the vote on the floor today, uh, this is engineering, budgetary engineering, designed to slash Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. As the AARP warns, the GOP balanced budget amendment, so-called, would subject Social Security and Medicare to deep cuts that would be, in their words, devastating for millions of Americans. The American people cannot afford Republicans' fiscal hypocrisy and their relentless efforts to gut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, I can't say it enough, just to enrich the special interest. Democrats know that investments in the health and strength of the American people are the best ways to reduce the deficit and grow the economy. In fact, nothing brings more money to the Treasury than investing in the education of the American people, early childhood, K-12, higher education, post-grad, lifetime learning for our workers. Democrats will continue to continue, will continue to cut the deficit, create good-paying jobs, protect American families with a better deal better jobs, better pay, better future for all Americans. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yield three minutes to the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Poliquin. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, very much. I appreciate, appreciate the time. <clears throat> you know, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the big career spenders here in the House and in the Senate – who have only recently found fiscal discipline. Well, today they have the chance to join me to vote for, vote yes, for a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. You know, when I was the main state treasurer, Mr. Speaker, I helped make sure that Augusta's books were balanced without gimmicks. Now, it's well time that Washington is forced, forced to live within its means, just like every other family and small business in the state of Maine. You know, Mr. Speaker, 49 states in this country have constitutional amendments at the state level to make sure they spend only what they take in. It's about time Washington has the same discipline. Mr. Speaker, it is not fair and it is not right when career politicians spend every single nickel that they collect from you in taxes and then borrow as much as they want to spend more. The spending in this town, Mr. Speaker, is out of control. Now, a lot of us have seen enough. That's why I ask every Republican and every Democrat in both the House and in the Senate to pass a common sense, balanced budget amendment to our Constitution. And I'm very proud to say, Mr. Speaker, that the first piece of legislation that I co-sponsored the day after I was sworn in three years ago was a balanced budget amendment. Every big spending bill in this town is loaded with pork. The process is terrible to force an up or down vote in the 11th hour on a bill that's a couple thousand pages long. It does not make sense. A balanced budget amendment would finally force Washington to prioritize our spending like we do for those of us that run businesses or balance a family check, uh, checkbook. Prioritize our spending and that will help eliminate waste. And that only will lead to balancing our books and then having the ability to start paying down $21 trillion in debt. You know, I look, Mr. Speaker, at these young adults in the gallery. It is immoral to saddle these great young adults with $21 trillion in debt and rising that they've got to pay. A federal government's budget, which is legally required to be balanced, will force the House and the Senate, even with the Senate's harmful 60-vote filibuster rule, it will force them also to spend only what we take in. Mr. Speaker, this is our chance today to start running our government more like a business, more like a family budget. It is main the common sense time has expired. to spend only what we take in. Yield the gentleman an additional 30 seconds. Thank you very much. The gentleman is recognized. 
one of the biggest gifts we can give to our kids and our grandkids is taking care of their spending and this debt problem so they're not saddled with a mountain load of this stuff. America today, Mr. Speaker, is watching. Who's got the guts? Which Republicans and which Democrats in the House and the Senate, who's got the guts to stand up and do what's right and pass a balanced budget amendment to our Constitution? I will. I look forward to it. I ask everyone to join me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back my time. The, gel the gentleman's time has expired. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the gentleman continue to reserve? Thank you. And, Mr. Speaker, what I'd like to do is ask unanimous consent to pass control uh, to, of the time to the Chairman of Judiciary, Mr. Goodlatte. With Thank you. Does the gentleman from Virginia reserve? Reserve. General Reserves, General Tennessee is recognized. Before I yield to Mr. Levin, the previous speaker said, does anybody have the guts to stand up? I'm standing up, and I voted against the tax cut bill and against the mammoth budget bill that caused this deficit to go up by $4 trillion. I yield to Mr. Levin for a unanimous consent request. I ask unanimous Gentlemen consent to revise and extend my remarks and to place them in the record. The gentleman's recognized. The gentleman's request will be covered under general leave. And now I'd like to recognize Mr. Langevin for one and a half minutes. Thank you, sir. The gentleman is recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, we absolutely need to address the crisis of our federal debt. And we do it by coming together in a bipartisan way, having the adult conversation, the difficult conversation, addressing both revenue and spending. This is not rocket science. Now, a balanced budget amendment would be worthy of consideration if properly crafted to provide flexibility in times of war, recession, or national emergency. And in fact, I have co-sponsored such a resolution. However, this rigid amendment fails to anticipate these unfortunate but inevitable contingencies. Instead, this resolution is a cynical attempt to paper over the enormous cost of the Republican tax uh, bill, the one that we recently passed and the one that was passed under George W. Bush, enacted to do the benefit uh, of special interests and the wealthy overwhelmingly in their favor, and to clear the way for wholesale cuts to critical programs for children and seniors like Medicare and Medicaid. And Mr. Speaker, Congress has all the legislative tools that it needs to fix the deficit, as we saw during the Clinton years, when they had the adult conversation, when they did the tough work addressing revenue and spending in a bipartisan way, when the federal government ran uh, budget